Good evening, church. Welcome. We are delighted that you're joining us tonight. We're here to celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ and, and spend some time in prayer as well. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, our thanks and our praise to you that we have this moment, this opportunity to join with you in fellowship, to experience your grace and your glory. Lord, come down and, and be with us as we worship together. Fill us with the presence of and the power of your Holy Spirit. Teach us. Raise our voices in song. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Join with us as we sing tonight. <coughs> We're going to put the words up on the screen. Oh, 
Praise the Lord. Great singing tonight, great songs. Tie right in with what we're going to be talking about in just a few minutes. We're going to reset things and then we're going to uh, take time to pray. You might be thinking about things you want to pray about. Uh, of course, as always, you can send us a text or an email and let us know exactly what you want us to pray about. We'll never mention your name, uh, but we will pray for you and we'll be sure to lift you up and name you before the Lord. There are lots of folks that are troubled this week, uh, some that are recovering, others that have uh, a difficult time and families that are struggling with uh, losing loved ones, and uh, we, we want to remember those people before the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the fact is, is that uh, he spent a lot of his time alone and praying, and a lot of his time holding up his apostles and his disciples, holding up the people of Israel, holding up uh, the, the way that he was going and, and the death that he was going to face. And, uh, you know, he set for us a terrific example, a wonderful example of how we ourselves ought to also pray. And so let's, uh, let's just remember that there are those that are sick and struggling, that there are those that are in uh, nursing homes and uh, are not happy with their circumstances, that there are, there are government leaders who need our help and guidance. We have all kinds of leaders who just simply need to find Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and their ways need to change as a result. Their attitudes, their values, the things that they treasure needs to change. And the only way it's going to happen is if Jesus takes a hold of their heart. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. God Almighty, King of the universe, we come before your presence in humility, knowing that you alone are worthy of praise, that you alone are able to provide our salvation, that you alone are in charge of all of the difficulties and the struggles as well as the triumphs of life. Sometimes life is just plain hard, and, and tonight there are those that are struggling with uh, loved ones that are in the process of passing from this life. There are those that are struggling with nursing home stay uh, and quarantine as a result, and we, we hold these people up to you, Lord. We ask that your presence and your power fall down upon them, and that you comfort them, and that you give them strength that you would strengthen and encourage the families of, of loved ones, and that you would strengthen and encourage us as a society, as a nation. We ask that you would pour down your Holy Spirit on the leaders of this nation, from the President down through the Congress and the Senate, down to the state representatives and the governor and the officials of our state, down to our county supervisors and our city managers and, and mayors, and our police and our fire and our uh, emergency services people, Lord, we pray earnestly, pour out on them your love and your kindness. Pour out on them the fullness of the power of the presence of your Holy Spirit. Lord God Almighty, there are businesses, business leaders who are suffering, who have lost their businesses, who have had to close and sell out because of rules that have been imposed upon them that disallow them from being open. No one, no one, Lord, can run a business without it being open, without sales. And we do pray, Lord, that your power, your presence, your glory would shine like it has never shone before upon this land. Welcome. Tonight we're going to take a look at the resurrection of Jesus, but we're going to cover a whole series of passages. I've synthesized or, or harmonized the stories in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, so the bits and pieces of what happened with Jesus and his death and his burial and his resurrection might all come together to show us the, the whole story 
the entire story about him and his crucifixion and his resurrection. Also want to point out that if you're watching this on, you, on Facebook, it will be posted on YouTube after the service is over. Uh, you can go to History with a capital S, Chapel of Waterville, Washington. And that is going to be the place where you're going to find it. Matthew 24. On the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. And as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Let's pause for prayer. Jesus, open our hearts and our minds to you. Teach us now. As we worship together, teach us through the power of your resurrection. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I was up in the mountains today and discovered that the sagebrush is blooming starting to bud out and leaf out, go from gray and brown and black to uh, the unique musty green color that it has. And looking at sagebrush plants, I realize how much we are really like sage. Think about it. Sometimes we smell a little funny, sometimes we smell feet sweet. So does sage. Sometimes we look dowdy and are all twisted and uncomfortable with ourselves. So is sage. Sometimes we find refreshing and we grow fresh and green again, just like sage. But it is that twistedness that ugliness that is ours, that Jesus came and gave his life for. Humankind became a twisted mass of emotions and pride and arrogance and violence and power and struggle and strain because Adam and Eve chose in the Garden of Eden. to eat from the fruit of the tree that they were specifically told not to. And in the first sales pitch of history, Satan told them that, oh, you won't die. God knows that when you eat that fruit, your eyes will be opened and you'll have knowledge of both good and evil. And that's a great thing to have. And Adam and Eve bought the lie, we oftentimes do, and every person since then has been cursed by greed and selfishness, twisted by sin, lived in corruption, 
an absence of the fellowship of God. And Jesus came. And he came and he gave his life to teaching us the real true nature of God. And he paid the price due to us for our sin on the cross. It was a horrible thing that we faced for our sins. Judgment and eternity absent from the power of God and the transformation that could be ours through Him. But let's just talk for a minute about Jesus and what he endured. You see, Jesus was taken into custody like a prisoner. Was tied up and taken before the high priest and accused. Taken and before Pontius Pilate accused. He was spat on. He was called names. He was struck. They beat him over the head with a reed. They scourged him. And I don't know if you know what a scourge is like, but it, there's nine tails in a scourge. Three of them are leather. Three of them have large lead balls that leave deep, deep bruises on the back. And they, when it strikes with the full force of an arm and an 18 inch handle. And then chunks of steel or bone or both. And those chunks of steel literally claw and rip the skin on the back. And 39 times, they struck Jesus and they ripped the flesh on his back, cutting the nerves, cutting the blood vessels, causing his back to become ribbons of, of nervous twitches and of pain. And then they took him out north of the city of Jerusalem, out what's called the Damascus Gate. And they crucified him in a place called the Skull. And the hillside literally is eaten away and eroded away to look like a two eyes and a nose and a mouth of a skull. And in front of that ugly, ugly mountainside, they put him on a cross and they put nails through his wrists that were seven inches long and three-eighths of an inch in diameter with a one-inch head and then also into his ankles. And they hung him on that cross. And from noon on the day that he was crucified until 3 p.m., the sun simply stopped shining. And Jesus breathed his last. And when he breathed his last and gave up his life, he was taking on himself what I deserved. Taking on himself what you deserved. Taking on himself what all humanity deserved. We deserve punishment and separation from the hands of God and from his love. And Jesus came and died in our place, in my place, in your place, so that we might have eternal life. Well, that all sounds really like a pipe dream in a, in a sense, except that after Jesus was put into that tomb and laid there for three days, he took life back to himself, proving that he is God and sealing our redemption with the fact that he's alive again anew. When Jesus was dying on the cross, there was a man came. And that man was a disciple of Jesus. He was a righteous man. He was a man that was part of the Sanhedrin but a man that didn't consent to the execution of Jesus and to his trial. And quite literally, Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate. The Bible says he gathered up courage and went to Pilate. And when he did, he asked for the body of Jesus after Jesus had died and given up his life.
and Joseph of Arimathea owned the garden beside the place of his call. It was a vineyard. Beneath it is the largest cistern in the entire Middle East. In it was a wine press. In it was grape vines and ways to process the grapes into wine. And in that orchard, that vineyard, Joseph had carved in a limestone hillside that conjoined the place of crucifixion, the place of the skull, and had carved his own tomb. He was an older man, expecting that he might die. And that brand new tomb which had cost him laborers and effort and money and time and energy in his beautiful garden became the burial place of Jesus. You know, it's interesting because Isaiah 53 tells us that Jesus took the penalty of our sin on himself. And he took the abuse and the pain and the suffering that was ours. And quite literally, that he died with sinners, with men convicted of murder, when he had done no wrong. But his grave was assigned with a rich man. How did Isaiah know that? 400 years before Jesus was even born. Well, it's because God knew it and told Isaiah. And Isaiah wrote down the literal words of God and prophesied that Jesus would come, that Jesus would pay the penalty of our sins, that Jesus would die, that he would be laid in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb, even though he had died with a bunch of scoundrels. And then there's this whole other problem with crucifixion. People in our world try to argue that, well, Jesus, you know, he wasn't really dead. Well, if you've ever looked at Roman crucifixion, you know that that's not possible. Romans were expert executioners. They killed over six million Jews on the crosses that they had all over that country. Six million. I don't think they messed with Jesus. Scourged to the point of death. Hung on a cross. And when you hang on a cross, not only is there that excruciating pain that comes from having those nails driven in your hands, but you're hanging on your wrists and you don't have the ability to breathe unless you push yourself back up, take a breath, and then you collapse again. And Jesus did that for three hours in total darkness before he finally gave up his life and passed away on that cross. And they wanted to make sure he was dead, so they stuck him with a spear and pierced his heart, his pericardium, and all the blood and all the water in his body were drained out right there on the ground in front of the cross. And yes, Jesus was dead. Well, Joseph had a friend, and his name was Nicodemus, who also was a disciple of Jesus. And Nicodemus came along with Joseph. And he brought spices, a hundred pounds of myrrh and aloes. And he brought linen wrappings. And Joseph and Nicodemus wrapped the body of Jesus with the aloes 
and with the spices. Now, there's a good reason why the Bible is really clear on that. You see, when you take that much liquid, 100 pounds of it, and wrap it up in a bo around the body with linen wrappings, it creates a cocoon. And as it dries, that cocoon hardens. And it was placed in that tomb. Nicodemus had made two burial places. Neither had been used. There was, if you go in the door of the tomb, on the right-hand side, there's another door into the area where the actual bodies are laid and they're laid in a pit in the ground so they all the liquid out of the body can drain into that pit and be and not run all over the floor of the tomb and there was one on the left and one on the right Jesus was in the one on the left and his body was put there and they rolled this massive stone over the top of that opening over the top of the opening and when they did Jesus was sealed in that in that place of death and of destruction. For three days. On the morning of his resurrection, Mary, who was a special disciple, who loved Jesus deeply. and served him faithfully during his ministry. Came to the tomb before dawn. Now the Jews, they, they were kind of worried that Jesus might pull a trick or disciples might steal the body. So they had secured a Roman guard. A cohort of Roman soldiers are powerful men. They are trained and muscled to defend six square feet around themselves. Six square feet around themselves. Six, six foot square, I should say, around themselves with a spear and a sword and protect the men beside them and the men in front of them and the men behind them. They are strong men. They are not weak-willed. But when the angel descended on the morning that Jesus rose from the dead and rolled the stone away and sat on the stone, there was a great earthquake and those guys, they passed out. Bible says they became like dead men. They were just laying there on the ground, frozen. I've only seen that happen once. We had a dog, small dog, that was barked at, jumped on, and not really bit, but symbolized by from a bigger dog. And the dog passed out and laid on the floor with its feet straight out and totally paralyzed for five minutes. We rubbed its chest until it finally started breathing again. Totally unconscious. That's the, the guards that were put at Jesus' tomb. Terrified because an angel descended from heaven. And when the angel descended from heaven in a cloud, it sat on a stone and rolled it away. So the body of Jesus could, the absence of the body of Jesus could be seen. Mary was there when that happened. The women with Mary came bringing more spices. Of course, they had watched the men wrap the body in aloes and myrrh. But that's not, you know, they didn't really, you have to understand, the men didn't do it right. <laughs> Simple truth. So they had to bring sweet spices to put on Jesus' body. And they brought their own. And they were going to go into the tomb and they were going to, adorn his body with sweet spices in addition to the myrrh and the aloes, a hundred pounds of wrappings that were on Jesus' body. But his body wasn't there. There's a word used in all four of the Gospels. It's a Greek word which really means to see something. To, and, and we translate it as behold because it really means more than just see. It means to really see Wow, that was something else. 
And so when they looked in that tomb, what did they see? Same thing the apostles saw. They saw this mummy wrapping collapsed in on itself without a body inside of it. It wasn't unwrapped around Jesus. Jesus just vanished out of it. Took life back to himself. And so laying there, laying there, was this linen wrapping. And in that linen, linen wrapping was nothing because Jesus had risen from the dead. You see, the death of Jesus was horrible, unbelievable, painful, terrifying. The resurrection of Jesus, on the other hand, was full of the glory of the power and the presence of God Almighty. And when Jesus took life back to himself, he left those grave clothes and all those aloes and all those spices and all the wrappings behind. He didn't need them anymore because he was alive. Jesus was alive. That's everything, because he took life back to himself. We can have new life. We can experience the joy and the transformation of our own thoughts and our own minds and our own hearts and our own lives, because Jesus is alive. And because he paid the penalty of my sin and of your sin, all we need to do is come to him and believe. That's all we need to do. And when we do, Jesus will fill us with the presence of his Holy Spirit and the same newness of life that filled him on the day of his resurrection will fill us as well. That we can have joy, real joy. Freedom from the pains and the hurts and the worries and, and struggles of life. Peace knowing that when we die, we rest in the hands of God and we experience his grace and His glory because the penalty of our sins has been rolled away by the, by the stone on the grave and by the blood shed on the cross. I wonder. If we're willing, ever so willing, to turn ourselves to Jesus. Just like on that dawn so long ago. and see the angel and know that our lives have been made new and that we are delivered by the hand of God. May we pray. Lord Jesus, come into our hearts and our lives. Open our minds to see and to know and to understand you. Fill us with a sense of confidence and of purpose so that we might know that we walk in grace with you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Your forgiveness and your patience. We seek you in the name of Jesus and by the power of his blood and ask that your, you would open our eyes, that you would refresh us, that you would strengthen us that you would help us to learn this lesson from the Exodus, that we might live as your people, the people of your pasture. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being with us tonight. We rejoice in you and praise you. Praise the Lord for you and ask that he would bless you. Joseph.